All right, take your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I try to bring, after so many years of pastoring and preaching and stuff, I try to find new things to preach on Christmas. It's kind of hard to do and stuff, but, you know, of course, you deserve something new and fresh yourself. And so this morning is kind of a Christmas message. It comes from the Christmas story, but a little bit different, a little bit different approach. And we're going to call this one today the Spirit of Elijah. And it's in reference to prophecy concerning John the Baptist, uh, that one that was born to be the forerunner of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read about his story here in Luke uh, chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 5 through 17. As you know, the angel Gabriel had come to Elizabeth and told her that she was going to give birth. They actually came to her husband and told uh, him, Zacharias, that his wife was going to give birth. And, and he doubted it, and so he wasn't able to speak uh, for nine months. Uh, Elizabeth, she was probably pleased with that, amen. But anyway, I have to listen to him for nine months and stuff. But anyway, so an uh, interesting story that God gives to us here. But it's also a partial, and I'm going to say partial, fulfillment of prophecy. So we're going to talk about that here this morning, about uh, this prophecy and kind of how that it is fulfilled, but yet how it is yet to be uh, fulfilled. Prophecy It's actually the last word given in the Old Testament at the end of Malachi. So we'll take a look at that. But what does it mean to us, the spirit of Elijah? You know, what does that mean to you and I as we're living in this world today? We have a responsibility as God's children to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We really do. Uh, and this world is sick, it's hurting, and it needs God. The only way they're going to get God is through us. And we have a responsibility to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to Him so that we can be God's ambassadors in this world, so that wherever it is that we work or live or play, that we can be a testimony to the people around us to bring them the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Always keeping in mind in our hearts and our minds that somebody shared Jesus with us. Amen. You know, who was that somebody for you? You don't have to answer. That's a rhetorical question. But, you know, who was that somebody that shared Jesus with you? Somebody took the time. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a preacher. Who knows? Uh, you do, though. You know who that person was that shared Christ with you and you accepted Christ as your Savior. What a blessed thing that was. Now we need to take that gift. That is the best gift that we could give this holiday season is the gift of of salvation, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's look at this story of, of Elizabeth and Zacharias and little baby John the Baptist and the spirit of Elijah and what this means to us. And so let's start reading there in verse 5. It says, There was in the days of uh, uh, Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abai, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, <clears throat> and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all his commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. What an awesome testimony these two had. And many people would say, wow, they were probably blessed. But what's the next thing to say? It says they had no child. And that would have been a tremendous burden upon both of their hearts. And yet even though they had no child, they continued to live for the Lord. They were continuing to be righteous and blameless. And we praise God for that. But then it says, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And we didn't actually get that far in our study of the tabernacle because we finished with our... Um, tabernacle series because of COVID and so I still have yet to finish that but inside here in this the temple proper uh, was this little thing right here if I can get a hold of it which was the altar of incense a little square box about that big and it had the two handles that they could carry it and this was the purpose of burning the incense and when the priest uh, would go into this first, first room which was the holy place and there was the table of showbread and the menorah the candlestick and then the altar of incense and the priest would go in and burn the incense, and then the smoke of that would waft up through and go out. And that was the prayers of the people being lifted up to God. And that's what Zacharias' job was, to go into that holy place. And what an honor it was to be able to go in that room, that first room there, to be able to go in there and to burn the incense to offer up the prayers of the people before God. Okay? 
And so verse 9, according to the cuts of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. You can just kind of imagine this scene in your mind, if you will. He's in there alone, doing his duty, doing his job, what he's supposed to be doing. And no one else is supposed to be in there. And there's heavy curtains there. And as he's there burning the incense, then appears an angel. Uh, I don't know if he screamed like a little girl or what. I don't know. But, you know, he was, he was afeared, as it says next. It says, when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine or strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And we know the story of how when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to visit Elizabeth, that the babe in Elizabeth's womb leaked, because even before this baby was born, the Holy Spirit filled him for the job that needed to be done. And so we see how that was fulfilled. Verse 16, it says, Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And this is the verse we want to concentrate on this morning. Verse 17, And he shall go before him, go before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's the thing that caught my attention as I was reading the Christmas story and preparing for my Christmas message today. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. What does that mean? The spirit and power of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah. Perhaps you've even heard that. Heard a song sung about that. Or read sermons or heard sermons or books or whatever. It is a common theme, a common thought. What does it mean? Well, we, we want to take a look at that today, what it means. We'll start with the prophecy first, and that's in Malachi. <coughs> Excuse me, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. That's actually the last two verses in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 are the last two verses in the Old Testament. It's the last word from God. It's the last thing that the people heard for a period of 400 years. And those are the words that God says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's stop and think about that for a second. The last words of the Old Testament is a threat of a curse if they don't get their hearts right. <laughs> Did they get their hearts right? No, actually they didn't. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so that's the reference that, that Luke chapter 1 verse 17 is making reference to this verse here in Malachi. And so we see in, 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 in a way a fulfillment of this prophecy. Okay, But it's not a complete fulfillment. I want you to understand that. Was John the Baptist Elijah? No, he was not. Okay, now, Some of you might, wait a minute, I thought he was. And we'll look at that here in a second. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But he was not that Elijah who many believe is still yet to come. Because when Elijah comes, it says he will come before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's when Jesus returns. Actually physically returns to this earth. That's the great day of the Lord that we look forward to. Many Bible scholars, myself included, if you know your book of Revelation at all, know that there will be two witnesses in those days. Amen? There will be two witnesses that come to, to witness before the people. And most Bible scholars believe that one of them is none other than Elijah that was promised who would come. Do you know who they think the other one was? Who was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah? Moses. Many people believe that it will be Elijah and Moses that are the two witnesses. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. You know, people like to speculate on that all the time. You know, and stuff. And so, but anyway, that's who many people believe those two witnesses will be. But there is a fulfillment yet of this prophecy that Elijah will come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. But John the Baptist did come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's what we want to look at today because that's what you and I can relate to as believers in Christ. We can live in the power and the spirit of Elijah as well. And we need to. If we're going to affect a change in this world that we live. Now Jesus did give testimony that John was a fulfillment of this prophecy. 
okay? Jesus did give John that testimony. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13, uh, his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake of them of John the Baptist. And so Jesus gives testimony of the greatness of John the Baptist, that he was truly a great man. As I said, filled with the power of the Spirit of God before he was even born. When Mary and Joseph came, or actually Mary came to visit Elizabeth uh, as, when she was pregnant, and how John the Baptist leaped in her womb, being filled with the Spirit. And so John the Baptist truly was a man filled with the Spirit of God for the purposes of God. You know, just before this whole Christmas holiday season, that's what I was preaching on, if you remember correctly, is you and I being filled with the Spirit and how important it is for you and I to be filled with the Spirit. It is something that we desperately need in this world today that we live. Uh, I think, I think, unless the Lord changes my heart and mind going into next year then, I'm going to start a series of revival messages because it's, I believe, what will fix our country. I think it'll fix this virus. I think it'll fix the political unrest and the social unrest if we would see revival. And it, 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 it's got to start somewhere. And so we're going to be preaching some revival messages, if it, starting with it, my people, which are called by my name. Now, again, but the Lord may change my mind. You stay tuned. You come back next week and you'll see. Amen? So then anyway, I believe that's what we're going to be doing. But John the Baptist had this testimony from Jesus Christ himself that he truly was working in the spirit and the power of Elijah. What an awesome testimony that was. Now, John the Baptist was what? He was just a man. Amen? That's all he was. He was just a man. Jesus, well, yeah, he's the son of God. He's special. We get that. But John the Baptist was just a man, just like you, just like me. And yet there was a little bit different about him in that he truly was filled with the Spirit of God. He had that testimony. You and I today, we need to have that testimony. And to be filled with the Spirit is to be emptied of self. To get ourselves and our selfish needs and our selfish desires out the way. To allow God to do a work in and through our lives. Are we willing to do that today? Now that Spirit of Elijah is a powerful spirit. Amen. Elijah again was just a man. He's a powerful man, powered by God Almighty. And we know that Elijah didn't die, did he? God, we sing the song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, came and took him up. Okay? You know the story. And who was Elijah's sidekick? Elisha. Remember Elisha followed him? He says, you come follow me. You're my, you're my, you're, you're my learner. You're, you're my disciple. Come and, and learn of me. And so he followed him. And when the time came that Elijah was going to go, this is the, 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 well, we'll get to that here in a second. Let's look at that power. Did it change yet? <coughs> of the Spirit. Who was this Elijah? Okay, or this Elijah? Who were you? It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for thee before I have taken thee away. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Think about that, okay? Elijah, powerful man, and we're going to look at some powerful thing that he did. Powerful man. God used him. People were afraid of him. Was he perfect? No. After he defeated the, the prophets of Baal and Jezebel and all that, he went and hid in a cave and was scared. So he's not perfect, but he certainly had the power of God upon him. He was doing great things. And Elijah followed him around and saw all these things that Elijah did. And when the time was coming that Elijah was going to go, Elijah said, Elijah, ask whatever you want. I'll give it to you. What did he ask for? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. That needs to be our prayer today. We need to have the spirit and power of Elijah. We need to pray for and want that power. Elijah and people a lot smarter than me have sat down and counted up the miracles that Elijah did. Okay? All the things that he had accomplished, all the things that he did in his lifetime and everything God used him to do. And then they counted up all the, the miracles that Elisha did. And again, people that are a lot smarter than I have studied this out. And guess what? Elisha did twice as much that Elijah did. Okay? But Elijah gets all the credit, you know, for the, being a great man. But Elisha had that double portion of spirit, and God used it. 
Could you imagine today, if we had a people, you, me, today, in this world, if we would pray that prayer, that I could have the spirit and power of Elijah in my life. Because it is possible. These are men, human men, born of men and women, just like you and I, that have sin natures, just like you and I, that are imperfect, just like in sinners, just like you and I. And yet they pray for the power of God to be upon them, for the spirit of God to be upon them. That spirit of Elijah, they prayed for that. God filled them with that spirit. God gave them that spirit and used them to do great things. My friends, that could be us today. And it needs to be us today to have that spirit. How important that is. Now, what, 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 what is one of the great things that Elijah did? Well, we talk about the, uh, the, the, how he called down fire and, and destroyed the altar of Baal there and it licked up all the rain. That's a great story. But also, this is another thing that he did. And James gives testimony to this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in James chapter 5, he says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Again, Elijah was a sinner. That's what he's saying. He was a sinner capable of sin just like any of the rest of us. He was not special. Okay? Sometimes we want to elevate him up and say, well, Elijah was this special guy, guy and God had... No! And that's what James is saying. Listen, he was, he was subject to temptation just like anyone else. But the difference was the prayer life of Elijah, the power of his prayers. And it says, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. <coughs> Think about that one for a second. The prayer of one man stayed the rains upon this earth for three and a half years. Now there was a purpose behind it because people had gotten away from God and Elijah wanted people to know that God didn't like it. And so God answered that prayer and he stopped rains for three, a three and a half year drought because of the prayer of one man subject to like passions, like temptations just like you and I. Think about that one for a second. Could you imagine to have that kind of power with God? But what I'm telling you today is that we can have that kind of power with God today. We truly can. Even you and I in this world that we live, with all of our imperfections, with all of the mistakes that we've made in our life, all it takes is to be that effectual, fervent, praying man or person if you want, okay? But then he prayed again and then the earth gave rain and brought forth her fruit after his prayers. What a powerful thing he did. Jesus says, listen, if you'll pray to that mountain over, over yonder to be removed, it'll be removed. All we need to have is the faith, the prayer of what? That little faith of a little grain of mustard seed. It doesn't take much, folks. The spirit and power of Elijah. That's what this world needs more than anything else today. Is for people to get on fire for the Lord. Stop focusing on what's going on out there in the world. You know, Trumpism and Bidenism and, and COVID and, and all this garbage that's out there. All you and I need to be focusing on, am I living for the Lord? Am I living for the Lord each and every day of my life? You know, I'm not perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination. You know that, okay? I do the best I can and I want to be found faithful, all right? But one thing I like to hear more than anything else, when I go to work at that grocery store... And, and I hear it almost every week. People, some of the works there are like, Brian, what are you on? They're all sad and discouraged and lonely and defeated. And I'm on top of the world. Outwardly, sometimes I'm struggling inside, amen, but I turn that over to the Lord. And they ask me, Brian, what are you on? And I love it when I get to tell them, come on, Jesus. Folks, listen to me. That's who we need to be in this world. That's what this world needs, especially now, more than ever. The spirit and power of Elijah. We can have that. We can have that power that Elijah had to pray that way. Okay? And it comes from the heart. <clears throat> we look at our text again. It says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. We need to have a change of heart. We truly do. You and I, each and every one of us, needs to have a change of heart. The Old Testament put it this way. In uh, Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, he says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. We need to have a change of heart today. And I guarantee you that's what the spirit of Elijah will do for you. It will change your heart. 
It'll help you to see the light, help you to, to, to give your life over to Him. I was thinking about that just this week, you know. <clears throat> I got saved in 1983. I gladly got saved. I was ready to get saved. The preacher asked me, you want to get saved? And I'm like, yeah. I think he was a little surprised that I said, yeah. He thought he'd probably have to argue with me a little bit to try and get me to get saved and stuff. But I was ready. So I did. I got saved. <clears throat> I was going to college, and so they, the, the Baptist church that I went to, they, they like to dunk you as soon as they can. So I got saved and baptized all that weekend. And, stuff. and then I went to college. And then I went to church. It's a couple of years, though, before I finally started going to church. But after a while, that Spirit of God just started touching on His heart. And I realized that I had no peace in my life. I had made a commitment to the Lord, if you will. I confessed my sins and asked Christ to be my Savior. And I gave my life over to Him. And so I really didn't have that peace. And I wasn't living for the Lord. And it was tearing me up. And so I'll never forget that day. I really won't. I'll never forget that day. The church I was going to go to... It was just a little country church and a milk house outside of town. I didn't have a car. And so I walked uphill both ways. But anyway, no, I walked to go to this church and stuff. And uh, I, I don't even remember how many miles it was. But I walked and I kept walking and walking. And I thought, it can't be that much farther. You know, this is before Google Maps and all that stuff. And so I'm not sure how far it was. Finally got there. I went to church. You know, I don't remember what the message was. I really don't. But I know that on that day, I finally made that choice. There was a change of heart in this whole boy. And I can tell you something else, that from that day forward, I never looked back. I continued to go to church. Now, thankfully, the pastor took pity on me and began to pick me up, so I didn't have to walk, amen? Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> and that was quite the feat, too. He had this little Chevy car. It was only about this big. I forget what it was. And he had a family of three, actually five of them all together. And we had to squeeze in this little car and get to church. Thankfully, they did. But anyway, and so, folks, we need to have that change of heart. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm not talking about when you get saved when you trust Christ as your Savior. Many people today, I believe, honestly, that, you know, they're saved, yes, but they've never had that heart-to-heart -heart with God. They've never had that stony heart removed and a heart of flesh put back in. A, a heart that is pliable, that allows God to, to guide you, direct you in your thoughts and your actions, your deeds. Does it mean we'll be perfect? No. But it means we're heading in the right direction. We're not going to turn back. We're not looking back. We'll be like Elizabeth and Zacharias. We'll be blameless before the Lord. That's what God's looking for. We need that change of heart. And that's what John the Baptist, that's what he was trying to teach the people, to change the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children of the fathers. We need that new heart today. Amen? All of us need that new heart today. You know, we can use a physical illustration as well. People that have heart troubles and, and, and stuff like that talk about the hardening of the arteries and how the plaque gets in there, the cholesterol clogs the arteries, and you don't have enough blood, and so your heart doesn't work the way it should, and, and so you can't breathe, you can't do nothing, you're just a mess, you know? Uh, but if we, you know, they go in there, or clean up the arteries, right, or put a stent in, or do whatever it is, and the blood starts to flow, and you feel better. That's what we need today. We need to have that spiritual cleaning out, amen? That's what we need more than anything else. Confess our sins, confess our faults, turn them over to the Lord, make a determination, I'm going to live for the Lord. We need a new heart, not only do we need a new heart, but we need a new way of thinking. Okay? We need to challenge everything that we think in our minds. We truly do. Is this true according to the Word of God? What I think, what I believe, is it true according to God's Word? I can honestly tell you, as I said, saved in 83, yes, but I didn't start going to church until 86. All right? <clears throat> Graduated Bible college in 90, came here in 92, you know, and here it is, 2020, all these years later. And I can honestly tell you that I am not the same man today that I was way back then. God has continued to do a lot of things in my life. He has changed my way of thinking for the better, for the good. As He has opened my mind to the truths of His Word. Not a, not a, new, not, not a new teaching. It's just me getting out the way and allowing God to teach me. Unlearning some things that were wrong. And so allowing God to teach me. But we need to have that wisdom, if you will. Proverbs, you want to learn about, we want to talk, talk about wisdom. Read the first few chapters of Proverbs. But in Proverbs 2, 2, it says, So thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. It takes effort on our part. Why do you think as a pastor and I constantly, constantly, constantly after people, read four Bibles, get in the Word of God. Because that's how we get a change of thinking. That's how we change the way that we're doing things. Um, <clears throat> My wife, as you know, is a diabetic, type 2 diabetic, and she has controlled her diabetes all these years by diet and exercise. She, she's not had to take insulin or pills or anything like that. That's how she controlled it. 
When we first found out that she had diabetes, she probably smacked me for talking about her. Lord, don't pay attention, but listen. But anyway, uh, when we first find out that she had diabetes, they wanted to put her on medication, and the medication made her sick. And so my wife said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this myself. It's, I've told you this before, but she got the textbook that you study when you're going to be a nutritionist. The thing was, I don't know, it was thick, but it was a great big book, you know. And she read that thing, and she learned how to eat. That's what she did. She learned how to eat, and so she changed her diet, and, and, and you know, uh, I remember when she started losing weight, people said, is, there, is your wife okay? She says, yeah, she's doing great. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's funny, I see pictures from back then, how she, but she just by eating right, and she got healthy, and she's controlled her, di her, her diabetes, her A1C has been under, was it six, is that the magic number? She's kept it under six and stuff, and the doctor's like, you're my poster child, blah, 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 stuff like that. And she did it by learning, by applying her heart to know wisdom. In this case, it was dietary wisdom, but she did it. You know, she had the willpower, the desire. She knew she needed to make a change, and she did it. Now, here earlier this year, she, her sugar started to go up again, and they wanted to put her on medicine, and so she did some more learning, and she's done it again. She's got her sugar back down where it's supposed to go again. God bless that woman. She's got such willpower, and she's making me have willpower, too. I've lost about 15 pounds myself here in the last few months and stuff like that. Can't keep my britches up anymore. Anyway, and stuff. And so people are, you okay? It's like, yeah, my wife's just making me eat right. You know, I haven't had a potato chip in months. But anyway, and so thank God for that. I thank God for a woman that loves me. But she takes the time to learn. And then she helps me as well. She brings others along. We need to have that attitude. Not learning dietary, but learning the truth of this book. It's here for us. God's holy word. <coughs> Excuse me. Not the COVID allergies. But anyway. And so God's given us his word so that we can read and learn so we can apply our hearts to understanding. There's no excuse. In school, when you took a test, if you got an F, you know, it was, oh, we want to blame the teacher. The test was too hard. But in reality, what was it? He didn't study. That's why we got an F, because we didn't study. i got to tell you something. One day, there's going to be a final exam. We're going to stand before God. Now, thank God, we already have entrance into the kingdom. Amen? Thank God for that. Okay? No matter how wrong I am, I still get to go. I have my ticket. Okay, But one day I will give an account of my life. And God's going to say, listen, I gave you all the answers. I gave you everything you need. It's your own fault. What a terrible thing that would be here. Amen? What a terrible, terrible thing. Instead, when I get there, I want to hear, I want to hear, ah, boy. I want to hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean I do everything right. But I want to apply my heart, my mind to know the wisdom of God so that my thinking is right and my heart is right. That's the spirit and power of Elijah. That's what we need today. To go out in the power and spirit of Elijah to do what needs to be done. So that as he says, the last part he says, uh, the turn, and to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and then to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, prepared for the Lord. Turn with me to this one in 2 Peter, if you would, okay? I didn't even write all this down, but I want to read all this here in 2 Peter. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1, starting all in about... Ah, verse... Verse 5 will work. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. He says, besides this, giving all the... Talking about being prepared. This is what we need to do if we're going to be prepared, okay? He says, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. He says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins, forgotten that he was saved. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. And for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, the Jesus Christ. Imagine when you get to heaven, God rolling out the red carpet and flinging open the doors. Come on in to the place prepared for you. 
And I believe, though, that so many a Christian today, and this again, I'm just using my imaginations, so many a Christian today are going to squeak in through the back door. Because they've lived just enough, done just enough. What a terrible thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to be mean, but what a terrible thing. Let's live for the Lord. Amen. We need the spirit and the power of Elijah today. We need your people that are willing to do that. If we're going to change this world, if we're going to change the way that people think, if we're going to change the way that do, people do things, and, and if we're going to see folks saved and make a difference, we need that today, and we can have it. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as you and I. And yet, friends, look at the power that he had. Amen.